What up, fam? Welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. So it is November, and as a lot of you may or may not know, that means it is time for NaNoWriMo. NaNoWriMo, or the National Novel Writing Month, is when a bunch of would-be novelists get together online and decide to write a novel in the month of November. The exact goal being 50,000 words. And I love challenges like this because it gets you into that mindset of a thing that you may have been interested in doing and thinking that maybe you, you couldn't actually achieve it. And it makes it into a game where you're racing each other and you're showing off how many words you've done that day. Uh, it really makes it an achievable thing. In fact, they call that gamification, which I have covered in a previous episode right here. But yeah, this challenge is really cool. I participated in it a couple years ago and I, I'm dabbling with it a little bit this year. I mean, Skill Tree keeps me pretty busy with writing my scripts and all that. But the really cool thing about it is you can have a work in progress and jump into it. The point is you need to finish your 50,000 words within that month. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to start that 50,000 words within that month. All right, so with all that said, today I'm gonna jump in on how to participate in NaNoWriMo, what you need to get started, and how to actually kind of go about writing something. So grab your quills or typewriters or whatever you kids are writing on these days, and let's level up this skill. How it works. So how does one start the daunting task of writing a novel in a month? As they say on the NaNoWriMo website, all you really need to get started is a profile and an idea. Once you've logged into NaNoWriMo.org, all you really gotta do is go up to the top right-hand corner and hit the sign up button. From there, it's gonna ask you for your email, passwords, username, all that good stuff. So once you've entered in all your personals and picked a username, all you have to do is go up here to the top and announce your novel. From there, you name your project, put where you are in the project status and what your privacy settings should be. Then once you've done that, you can fill in your genre, add a project summary, all that good stuff, whatever details you feel like adding at that point. And that's it, from there, all you're really doing is updating your word count and keeping track of how far you get within the month of November. And to help keep you motivated, it has cool things like little badges you earn from word count and how often you're posting your progress. But that's not it, because there is a whole social component too, a big group of people who are doing the same thing you're doing, going through the same challenges and struggles and willing to help push you along. Currently, most of them are meeting online, but like before COVID times, they'd have actual groups where you'd go to like a coffee shop together and everybody would just be in there writing. It was really cool. But clever you say, that's all well and good. That's just the website. The real hard bit is writing the 50,000 words in the course of a month. I agree. That comes out to about 1,667 words a day. If you started on November 1st. If you are watching this the day it comes out, however, it is November 6th, you're running late. So to help you catch up, let's make sure you have the right tools and materials. All right, so tools and materials. It is writing, really the basic bones of it. All you need is a pencil and some paper and an idea and a plot and we'll get into that bit afterwards. But for the tools right now, pencil and paper will do you. Obviously you could also use a computer or a freaking typewriter. I like using my iPad to be honest with you. My dirty little secret is I'm really bad at typing and the iPad makes it so I can just write it and then it converts it to text. Perfect. The only caveat is you wanna make sure you're able to keep track of that word count, right? Because we're trying to get to 50,000 words. You have to have a way to be able to track that. I never tried it with just pencil and paper, but I imagine, imagine that counting gets real tedious after a while. Tell me down in the sections if you know of a way to kind of keep track of word count with written word. So I've read a lot of authors mention this. Most recently, I've read Stephen King's On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft. And he talks about having a space that is just for writing. It is so easy to get distracted just by the things you have to do, the notifications coming up on your computer or your phone or whatever. And if you're serious about trying to make your word count or just trying to write in the first place, you really need to have a space that once you sit in it, your mind knows, this is where I come to work. That's it. I think Stephen King mentions that his is just kind of in the corner of a room facing a wall. And though my actual like novel and story writing is pretty limited, I actually write a lot of scripts all the time. And I can attest to that. If I am somewhere that I can see other things happening, I will focus on everything but the thing I am writing. So isolate a place that you know you can focus and that is away from stuff and also isolate some time that is just your time. Tell the other people in your life that just for this month, this chunk of time, an hour or two is just for you and you're gonna be away doing something else. 
And finally, it helps me if I make it kind of a ritual. Like some people like to get up first thing in the morning before they go to work or anything, and that's their writing time. They sit with a cup of coffee, they sit in their spot, and they know right from then on, it's time to start writing. I personally am a useless chunk of flesh before 8 a.m. So my optimal writing spot is between the hours of like seven and nine. That's really where my brain wants to sit and focus. But it's gonna be different for everyone, so just kind of feel out what you need. All right, so you have your writing implement of choice, you have the spot with which you will write. Now you can move on to actually getting started. So if you're at all like me, you should be thinking at this point, yeah, but how the hell do I write a novel? And let me preface this all by saying, I am not a professional author. I just did a whole bunch of research on this and have written some in the past. If you are a professional writer, leave in the comments section anything that I miss. So first things first, we're gonna wanna get an idea about what this story is about. Now this idea doesn't have to be big or fully formed to get started. Just something interesting enough that can carry a whole story, right? So for example, a mistreated orphan learns that there is a whole magical world out there and he's actually a famous wizard. Now what? That can obviously be a quick and dirty beginning for Harry Potter, right? Or something like the Count of Monte Cristo, right? A man escapes wrongful imprisonment, finds a treasure and uses said riches to wreak revenge on those who betrayed him. It's just the basis of an idea, but it's very interesting and it's something that can grow and move somewhere. Like I think Stephen King says it really well when he says, put interesting characters in difficult situations and write to find out what happens. Okay, so once you have your kernel of an idea, it's time to figure out what kind of writer you are. I've heard these broken down into two categories. There's the planner and then there's the pantser. The planner is a person who plots out every single thing that's going to happen. They know from point A to point B where their story is going, all the highs and lows, and the characters, they all have bios and what they're, everything is detailed and written out. And this is really cool. It makes the writing process pretty streamlined. The only issue with it is if you ever want to change it or you decide that this isn't where you want it to go, everything before it's kind of been setting that up and now you kind of have to rewrite your whole script. The pantser, called that way because you're flying by the seat of your pants, uh, also called a discovery writer, is somebody who doesn't know where the story is going. It kind of surprises you as you go. And I fall distinctly within this camp. I am terrible at sitting down and planning a story. I love the process though of having these organic characters kind of show themselves to me as we go. Ultimately, it's gonna be a personal choice for you. That's just kind of how I like to work, but whatever floats your boat. Speaking of which, the next thing you're gonna need are characters. No matter what, stories are about people. Even if those people aren't necessarily human, they're going through things that you and I can relate to, and thus it is a story we wanna read. So yeah, obviously you're gonna need your protagonist or protagonists who your story is about, right? And this is one of those portions that I actually do end up doing a little bit of planning myself. And it could be because I play a lot of D&D &D and it's basically making a character sheet. But I feel like once I understand who this person is or these people are, I know how they would react in certain situations. I can put myself in their shoes with their particular kind of outlook and, and knowing what their past is and be able to say, no, th this is how this particular person would react to this particular situation. Ultimately, in my view at least, they should be like real people. They should be interesting, but flawed in some way, right? Nobody really wants to read about a Mary Sue, somebody who can just kind of flow through life and no consequence actually touches them. That's not interesting. The interesting bits are in the drama and the suspense of what's happening to this person. Speaking of the drama, we also need some sort of antagonist. And again, they should be fleshed out just as much as the protagonist is. I love when I read a book and when you finally see the point of view of the antagonist, you can't help but agree with them a little bit. They have solid reasons for the things they're doing. It's not just because they're the bad guy. And I love that. It adds so much depth to the world. They're people and I, I, I genuinely want to care about these people and why would I continue reading your story if I don't care about the people that the thing is happening to. All right, so we have our idea. We know how we're going to try to execute this thing. We have some characters. Now we got to figure out what the plot of this thing is. A plot is what actually happens in the story. Arthur Margaret Atwood has a really nice, succinct way of putting this in her little masterclass that I've included a link to down below. But she says that a strong plot is centered on one moment, right? A break from the average or from the normal. So again, using Harry Potter, you have a young boy whose life is living with the Dursleys. He's mistreated. He's shunted under the stairs. And then one day he gets a letter from an owl that says he's accepted to Hogwarts and that he's a wizard and all that. 
So the whole rest of the story is him getting exposed to and finding his way within that wizarding world. Then from there, you add in the subplot of the Sorcerer's Stone and the mystery around that within this whole introduction to the world. Now there's a whole bunch of different ways you can structure your plot. One of the more basics is called Frytag's Pyramid. First you have the exposition, the beginning of the story. Harry Potter at the Dursleys before he meets Hagrid. This is that status quo that we need to break. Next we have the rising action where we start to raise the stakes and build some tension. Again referring back to the Harry Potter book, this is everything before they have to get past Fluffy pretty much. They're exposed to the mystery, they're finding clues, there's a troll in the bathroom, all of these things, everything is raising the tension ever higher. The climax, they're playing wizarding chess and they have to go fight to get the Sorcerer's Stone and all that. The action is happening. Once we've gotten past the climax, we have the falling action, where people have to deal with the consequences of the climax. This is where people are realizing a bit who might have been behind the whole thing. The different houses being awarded points in the banquet hall, all of that stuff is that falling action. Finally, there's the resolution. The school year has ended, everybody's going home, the story is over, but our protagonists have changed in some way because of their journey. But again, that's just one model. I, I prefer one that's called In Media's Res, where you start on that rising action, so you start with things really tense, all the way up to a climax and then resolve. Just, I like how much that grabs somebody. Again, in that same Margaret Atwood article that I'm linked to below, she has like seven different plot structures in there you can go off of and just kind of look them up and see which ones you like the best. Okay, the next important thing you're gonna need to isolate is the point of view you wanna write from. There are in general four points of view you can use. There's first person, which is the kind of story you tell throughout your day when you're talking about something you've done, right? So like I went to the grocery store and I picked up some milk and this lady ran into me with her cart. I'm the person the story is happening to, first person point of view. Second point of view is one that really isn't used very often. It's me telling a story about you. Where you would kind of see this typically is in like choose your own adventure books, right? You go over here, you do this thing, what do you do next? Then there's third person limited. Third person in general tends to be one of the more common points of view and that's using things like he or she or they. He struck with his sword, the wind blowing in his hair. The limited in third person limited means that the narrator only knows the thoughts and feelings and experiences of a single character. All other characters and their motivations and thoughts and all of that are mysterious to you. You don't know anything but what your main character is feeling. And the fourth one is third person omniscient. Here the narrator is God. They know the thoughts and feelings and motivations for everybody in the story. Again, which you decide to use is gonna come down to your personal preference and which you like to write. But make sure once you've picked one, you mostly stick with that. Only stories I've ever read where they were able to successfully kind of flip between them is where you have your main character who is that limited perspective and then you might have like a, a little break where there's like a god character watching over everybody knowing everybody's thoughts and emotions. As far as I know it's super rare and I feel like it'd be something that's hard to do right. If you know of a story that successfully switches point of view I want you to leave it down in the comment section I'd love to read it. All right, and the final thing that I was able to glean from kind of writing and doing some research is the, the old adage of show, don't tell. So what this basically means is you can go ahead and just say, Bob was struck by lightning. Sure, it says what happened, Bob got struck by lightning. But it's not particularly interesting, is it? Or you can say something like, Bob felt the hair on his arm begin to stand as the sky rumbled above him. Then there's a blinding flash of light followed by darkness. He didn't even hear the crack of the thunder after the strike tells the same thing. Bob was struck by lightning. One, I would argue, is infinitely more fun to read than the other. All right, so that's what I got for you. Are you ready to take on this challenge? Don't worry if it feels super daunting or you don't feel like you're going to reach your word count. I myself got to, I think it was 36,000 words. Um, it was during a year where I was like moving and changing jobs. But fam, honestly, I didn't think I'd ever get to 30 something thousand words in the course of a month. That's big. And so for me this month, I'm starting with that 36,000 words and I'm gonna finish my 50,000. I'll have a novel by the end of this month. That's cool, that is fun. I don't care that I didn't start from zero this year and made it to 50. By the end of the month, I will have a novel that I wrote. That's cool. The point is it gets you out of your comfort zone and doing a thing you didn't know you'd be able to do and I love that. I think that is just magic. But also know that it doesn't have to be a polished, completely finished thing. The, the point of this is just to get it down on paper and get it done. Think of it as a rough first draft. From here, if you love the story and you like the process, you can then tweak it and do a second draft and clean it up and have other people read it. 
no matter what, when the world is no longer falling apart and we can be at restaurants with random strangers again, you can continue your quest of being the most interesting person at that table. By now we've done metalsmithing, leatherworking, I wrote a novel. Come on, come on. <laughs> you are awesome and if you are into this kind of thing, I hope you give it a try because I know you can write something amazing. Speaking of doing amazing things, it's time to shout out our monkeys and see what they've been working on. I feel like I say it every time I show off all of your stuff, but I am so genuinely impressed with our community. And as we grow, I'm getting introduced to more and more of you and seeing the things that you're able to do. And I am blown away by the projects you guys are producing. Now, all of these pictures are being taken from the Discord. So if you have stuff you wanna share with me, definitely join up there so you can leave the pictures and I can post them here. It really is just an incredible community of people doing amazing things and generally just being really cool with each other. Speaking of really cool, I need to shout out Joey Bag of Donuts. He recently moved up from a lower tier in my Patreon to the Diamond Orangutan tier. For some reason, Patreon didn't ping me to tell me that you guys move from one thing to another thing. I just kinda watch more closely. So Joey, sorry it took so long. You are incredible. Thank you so much for your contribution. It really makes a big difference. If you like this show and kind of what I do here, why don't you consider joining the Patreon? All the tiers come with different benefits and honestly, every little bit you give really helps me kind of keep this thing running and growing. All right, I think that's, yeah, that's all I have today. Yeah. If you liked what you saw, why don't you give me that thumbs up love and do not forget to subscribe so you know when I release new content. Also, if there's a skill you'd like to see covered, why don't you leave it in the description and I will add it to the list. All right, I really gotta get going. I have like, 20,000 more words to write. Luckily, I have the rest of the month to do it. In the meantime, keep leveling up, you.